Hey everybody, welcome back to Binary Adventure Rust Tutorials. So today I'm going to go over lifetime specifiers and talk a little bit about lifetimes. Um, I want to clear up confusion with uh, lifetimes specifiers on functions. This stuff can be very, very, very confusing, very complicated, and it usually throws beginners off. It threw me off. Um, and it is just it's just like one of the hardest things if not the hardest thing to understand in rust and actually it's pretty hard to understand in programming in general um, so what I want to show you real quick is a lot of people know this right if you program and see it all um, most of us know the idea of what a scope is or um, like a block so that which in which things can go out of scope right so down here we have a function um, it returns the integer pointer and there's a problem here the problem is that we create an integer on the some function stack okay now the problem is is that when we exit some function that stack goes away and we're trying to re return we're returning the address of the integer in this function stack and if we were to try to use this, um, if we were to try to say, you know, int star weird equals some function. The problem is, is that now, if we were to try to dereference this, you know, using printf percent d, and then like star weird, this would be bad because we're trying to go into the stack of some function when it no longer exists anymore. Um, so that's what we mean by scope. You know, this we're, we're trying to, to access memory in a variable that's out of scope here. So that concept's not that hard to understand. But when it comes to Rust, though, um, you have to actually keep track of these things in your head, and you have to explicitly specify them when, when it involves references. And that's when people get tripped up. And especially with this strange, like, tick syntax, it's just not something that you have to do in other languages. And it can just be really, really confusing. Um, and like the purpose for which you have to do it, why you need to do it, what's really going on. It's just sort of like a big uh, a jumble, you know, and like the books explain it, but they just, in my opinion, they just don't really do it justice. Like you're not going to just read the book, you know, read a couple pages of the book and then just be like, oh yeah, I got this. So I want to talk about in this video, I'm going to, I'm going to demo some situations here. Um, so, um, the first thing I want to demonstrate, I'm actually going to get rid of this right here like this. So the first thing I want to show here is, is that again, pretty obvious we we're creating a variable here called R and we're moving the stuff from CR into R. Okay. And then we're passing a reference to R into this function called three refs. Should be called four refs, but I forgot to change it three or change it to four refs from three refs when I was experimenting. So um, we pass the the uh, reference to R in there. Now, if three refs, if this if this is all that happens, this is fine because for the entire duration of the three refs execution, R is available, right? Because R goes out of scope and gets you know basically destroyed when we hit this ending curly brace here. So as long as we're not trying to use R down here, then we're good, right? And likewise, if we return a reference to R by doing something like this, and then we try to use this down here, that's bad. Because the problem is, is that now we're saying, okay, well give us the address of R, put it in E, and then, and then now, you know, that, that's been destroyed or, or, or freed, basically. And now we're trying to use it. So that would be bad, right? So again, I'm going to remove this E here, but I want to explain that concept to you. Pretty obvious, you know, we have this, this block here. And um, if you know, you know, a little bit about Rust, you know that, that borrows end and um, variables, you know, they, they go out of scope when you hit the ending curly brace of the, of the current block, okay? So let's look at this. Let's look at this three refs function definition. There's a lot going on here, okay? And um, we're gonna do something. We're gonna do something kind of interesting. But before we do that, actually, take a look up here. I want you to look at this right here. Let a int 32 equals negative 423. Okay. 
So the lifetime of A here ends here. Because that's when that's when this function block, the scope ends, okay? Now we're gonna call this tick A. We're gonna call this this lifetime area here tick A between between here and here. So I'm gonna temporarily get rid of tick B. And what a lot of people will do with, with these lifetime specifiers is they don't really know what's going on. So this is what they'll do. First, they'll start with no lifetime specifiers, okay? They'll be like, um, let's just get rid of all this. Let's get rid of that. And then we'll try it. Okay, so we're going to take in four references and we're going to try to return a reference here. You know, it doesn't seem to be a problem. Let's try to build it. And then they get this error that says, like, missing lifetime specifier. So, oh, and then let me comment this out for now as well, because that was a demonstration. So they get this error, says busy lifetime specifier. And so then a lot of times what people will do is they just kind of spam the lifetime, right? Because it seems like it, it fixes the problem. So let's just put tick A here. Let's put tick A there. Let's put tick A here. Let's put tick A here. And then let's put like tick A here because that'll also, you know, yell at you. And then let's put tick A there. And, um, Cool, let's try running it again. Oh, look, it builds, it runs fine, right? All right, cool, well, let's move on, you know? And the problem is, is that this is this is just a lack of understanding of what lifetime specifiers are really for and what's really going on with the lifetimes here. And so that's what this video is trying to clear up, okay? Because this is this is kind of like wrong. I mean, it, it, it builds, but this is all this is not all necessary. And the way this is defined is is, is wrong, really, too. So. Um, and first let's look at the body of this function. So let's, let's consider two things. First, let's consider what's actually going to happen. So this is an if statement. If statement says, if, you know, if the reference a is less than five, then we're going to return CR dot interf. Okay. Now, if we actually look up here, we can see that a is negative 423. So this is this is always going to occur, okay? The, the, the else is never going to be reached, ever, okay? However, we do have the, elf, the, the else in there, and you got to remember that at compile time, this function is not evaluated, and so Rust doesn't really know that. It doesn't, it, it can't really figure that out. And so what it does is it says, okay, what could possibly be returned? And so one of the things that could possibly be returned is cr.interf. And remember, cr is a reference to the complex refs uh, type, which is uh, tick A as well, because um, interf is, has a lifetime of tick A, okay? Or A could be returned. And A is another... Uh, reference to integer 32, or borrow to integer 32, okay? So the two possibilities here is that A can be returned or CR.interf can be returned. So those are the only two things that need lifetime specifiers here, okay? So that means you don't need tick A on B, you don't need tick A on C, okay? And what you're doing is you are mapping which of these arguments could possibly be returned to the return lifetime, okay? So again, you're mapping, you, that's all you're doing. You're, you're telling the compiler, because the compiler, it wants to know by just reading this line here. It doesn't want to try to figure out what's going on in here. It wants to know by reading the line here what to expect. So you're saying, okay, in this function, either variable a, which is a reference of uh, lifetime tick a, or variable cr, which is another reference, could be returned. And so what it's saying, it's, what it's doing is it's looking through here and it's gonna compare the lifetimes that you place to the lifetime of the return. And if the lifetimes don't match, there's gonna be a problem, okay? So let's, uh, let's dig a little bit deeper into this. So now, before we, we go any farther, I want you to notice something here. 
I want you to notice what the actual lifetime is. The actual lifetime of A is tick A. Because again, I said for this for this tutorial, we're gonna consider here to here to be tick A. Now, I want you to pay close attention and see here that we're passing the address of R in as CR to this function. And we're saying that it has a tick A lifetime, but that's not true. Because as you can see here, R is does not have the same lifetime as A. R has a separate lifetime because we created it in this, this block right here. So R has a much shorter lifetime than A does. But we're just saying to the compiler, well, it has tick A lifetime anyway, so just, you know, just accept it. And the funny thing here is that this code built, again, I'll, I'll do it again, this code builds. So the question is why? And this is where it starts to get really, really confusing because you start to wonder, you start to question, why are we even using these lifetime specifiers if I can specify the wrong lifetimes and the code still works? And the reason why is because it goes past what's going on in here and it also goes into what's going on in the code here. So even though we're returning the reference here, we're not actually, we're not actually using it. We're not borrowing it at all. So the compiler can see that and it doesn't really care. Okay. And that's where this let E thing comes in. Okay. So if I uncomment let E and then I say E equals here, the return value of three refs, now there's going to be a problem. Can you see why there could be a problem here? Because now what's going to get returned is this. which is part of R, and then R is gonna go out of scope here and, 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 and no longer be reachable memory. But E has a separate lifetime. E, e has a tick A lifetime, and R does not. R has some other lifetime. It's a shorter lifetime as we specified, okay? Or as we said earlier. So if we were to try to use E down here, that would be really, really bad. That would be a situation that you could do in C that would cause a segmentation fault or something, okay? Or un undefined behavior. So if I do this now and I, tr and I try to run the program, watch. R does not live long enough. Now there's a problem because we're actually acting upon the return value. We weren't acting upon it before. It wasn't, it wasn't being borrowed, so it didn't care. It was, it, it, there was no problem, okay? So it's more than just we're lying to the compiler. The compiler only cares if we're lying to it if if it can create a problem, <laughs> okay? So the question is, how can we fix this, you know, leaving this code the same? Now, the cool thing is, is that that's where lifetime specifiers come in. Because remember, we're, we're telling the compiler relative information. That's all we're doing. We're, we're mapping to the compiler the lifetimes of these values. That's that's all we have to do. So what we need to tell the compiler is these are two different lifetimes. Because right now we're lying to it. We're saying, hey, A and and the return, you know, and R basically are of the same lifetime and that's not true. So we're going to change that now. We're going to leave A as tick A because that's what it is. And then we're going to change CR to tick B. Okay, but we're going to leave the return type to tick A, and this can be confusing as well, okay? The reason why we're going to leave the return type to tick A is because the return type, uh, the return here is actually cr.intref, which inside of the struct is tick A. So it's a different, we're not talking about this tick A. We're talking about the tick A that's relative to the struct. Because remember, we're returning a struct member here. We're not, re we're not just returning the struct itself, okay? Or, or the reference to the struct itself. So let's see what happens now. Look, it builds again. So check that out. And then this is where I, this is why I commented this out. We can actually use that value now. So the compiler figured out what was going on and it kept the data alive long enough because we told it, we gave it these lifetime specifiers, okay? 
check this out. Boom, prints out the number. So it was able to access it. It was able to use it because we said, hey, there's two different lifetimes here. And these are the two different lifetimes. And this is what we're expecting in our return. So that is how lifetime specifiers work in Rust with functions, okay? You're mapping input to output. That's all you're doing. So you, you don't need arbitrary lifetimes unless something's being returned. If, not, you know, if you have three or four references and none of them are being returned, you don't need a lifetime specifier here. If you have four references and only one of them is being returned, then you only need one lifetime specifier. And you need to place it on the return and then on the, the input reference. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you another thing here. I'm going to get rid of, um, I'm just going to return a value. So I'm not going to return a reference anymore. So I'm going to return an int32. And I'm going to get rid of all these lifetime specifiers. Okay. There's going to be no more lifetime specifiers at all on this. And what we're going to do here is we're going to return the values. We're going to dereference these so that it matches the return type here. And then what we'll do here is we'll print out the value. And we're going to run it. Oh, what did I do? I left a, a lifetime specifier somewhere. Oh, see, we don't even need this lifetime specifier. <laughs> Check it out. We got 423. So it doesn't matter that we have a bunch of input references here because we're not returning a reference. And so we don't need the lifetime specifiers because we're returning a value. We're moving the value into E, and then we're printing out E, okay? So I really hope that this has cleared up some confusion about Rust's lifetime specifiers. You have to see it in action. You have to do comparisons. You have to experiment. It's a tricky, tricky thing, and there's a lot of it. I mean, you know, you saw I had to have the brackets here. I had to have a specifier there. I had to have a specifier here. I had to have a specifier here. I had to have a specifier here and more brackets. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of noise and people see this and they just get scared and they don't really understand what's going on. But remember, all you're doing is you're mapping an input to an output. That's it. And if you don't have either an input or an output, then you don't need to put the lifetime specifier there. So thank you guys for watching and gals. Um, click subscribe if you like the content and we're going to have more good stuff coming. All right. Take care.